Seclusion is a huge part of finding inspiration and it's a, it's a big part of the creative journey for me. Taoism, how much time you got? This, the whole idea and the whole goal of this is to turn their trauma into art. They have to be the best potatoes so that you're known as this guy who makes, the Palestinian guy who makes the best potatoes in the world, you know what I mean? Hello, my name is Diana Sher. welcome to Dialogue Channel. Today my guest is Palestinian contemporary artist based in Canada, Dalia El Sharbini. Hello Dalia, thank you very much for being here um, yeah. all the way from Canada. <laughs> thank you very much for your time. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to, well, pleasure to meet you, I guess. This is a virtual meeting. Yes, that's true. Uh, before we start talking about your present, I would like to know um, if you remember the moment when you realized that you want to dedicate your life to art. Well, honestly, I feel like it was not much of a choice and there was not like a transition period in my life where I was like, this is it, I just want to do art. But I've always loved, loved art. I always loved to create. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just like visual arts. I just like to create stories even like I remember <laughs> I remember my sister would come and like watch me play with my Barbies for hours because she would be so into the story I just had that this like super um like intense imagination and I just wanted to create with whatever means I had so if it's my toys my Barbies or if it's you know creative tools to to create uh, a painting or a sculpture then so be it um also my mom is an artist um ah. yeah she is she's a she's a she's an oil painter and she does acrylic too her style is a little different but um but yeah i th i feel like it was part of my genetics did you study art or it was just like you followed your feeling yeah so this is this is the funny story i actually didn't go to school for art at all i actually went to school for film i went to mcmaster university i studied film and theater um, but I always drew in the background like when I had a lot of exams and I was anxious I would draw more because that would just kind of like Heal my anxiety and just makes me feel a little more at ease. So it's always been in the background um, I try to do shows here and there but that like switch to become an artist uh, was not like it, it, I never planned for it because I, I come from as you know, like we're Palestinians, we, our families are traditional. So if I tell them that my dad is a doctor and my mom, she's a teacher. And if I tell her, mom, I just want to be an artist or dad, I just want to be an artist. It's not the most um, exciting th thing for them to hear because they can't, they can't kind of project your future or what are the possibilities? What are the opportunities that you're going to be, fa that you're going to be presented with as a visual artist? Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, just the past six years, I, I took it so seriously and I just wanted to go all the way and just see where it takes me, just fully follow my heart and my passion. So it's last six years when you really focused on it, right? It was an on and off thing until the last six years. It was just like, okay, I have to be part of exhibitions in Canada and I need to do larger scale paintings and like really like uh, make my mark in the Canadian art scene, if you will. Mm -hmm. And your style is called surrealist realism, right? Yeah. So for those people that don't understand, um, like, you know, um, that are not professionals in art, can you please explain what it is about, uh, why it is called this way, this style? Yeah, so I, I, I like to call my style surrealist realism because I've always been fascinated with figurative art and just the human anatomy in general. And actually, I started studying anatomy at 15. When I was in high school, uh, I think it was grade nine or 10, um, I had a teacher who, who basically, he, he found out that I'm obsessed with art. Like I'm just, I'm not like your, your uh, regular art student. I would literally like spend lunchtime in, in the art, in art class. I was just too obsessed with art. So one time he comes to class and he drops this like huge sketchbook it was an 18 by 24 inch sketchbook in front of my desk in front of the whole class and he was like all i want you to do from now to the end of the year just sketch out uh this anatomy book 
and take like muscle formation from this anatomy book and practice it on in your sketchbook and fill it up fill it from like the first page to the end page and i'll give you a hundred and i actually ended up getting a hundred and twelve percent in that class but that that gesture meant so much to me like he probably just thought it was something like like it, it, it's nothing but to me it was it was huge and and i really believe in the value of teacher the, the teachers uh bring to the students especially when they're teenagers in terms of like inspiring them and kind of like molding their uh the way they think of what what their potential could be so for me i just i just when he did that i was like wow like this art teacher thinks i can draw and and i just thought yeah why not actually like really um you know like focus on this anatomy and and st and perfect like the human anatomy and then the more I practiced it, the more naturally it would come to me. So now I draw from imagination. So if, if I have like a s specific composition of the human body, I can actually like come up with it without looking at a reference. Um, so that passion for figurative art mixed with my interest in surrealism as an art movement for from like forever. I've always been like um, a fan of Salvador Dali, for instance. This idea of... Uh, getting some figurative elements into the surrealism, the surrealist world and creating something and calling it my own world has been just an addiction of mine, I guess, for for a while now. Yeah. But well, that's also great that you meet this kind of people on your way, because this is so important. Huh? So that uh, thanks to this teacher that he actually, you know, is, he just said, do that. Yeah, <laughs> that's so important. For him, it probably meant nothing. For me, it's it's something I'm talking about today. And that was like, what? Like, I don't even know how long ago. Yeah, it's it's huge. Right. And you have very interesting technique because you use earthly materials. It's a graphite and a gold leaf. And that's so interesting because it looks like very authentic and it's your special style. How did you come to this uh, style? Um, so graphite, I've always liked and enjoyed the grayscale uh, look more than colors. I don't know why I felt like I communicated my ideas and my concepts better in grayscale. And I'm a lot more comfortable with dry mediums. I paint, I sculpt, I've experimented with a ton of mediums over the years, but graphite I feel like is my calling and I I've gone through a journey with graphite like I don't draw with, with the your typical pencil I draw with yeah. the graphite powder so it's an actual it's like a crushed form of graphite and brushes and that eliminates the shine of the graphite and then gold on the other hand gold have I've always admired gold in architecture and like in fashion and and it's always just been like a fascinating metal to me. And I, I started developing this technique of gilding on paper. The, just It's not that old, to be honest. Like I've only started doing this maybe four or five years ago. So before that, it was just graphite. And after, after I discovered that I can use gold, I started uh, experimenting with trial and error. I, I've developed my own techniques to apply gold leaf onto paper. Um, mm. So the gold reflectiveness and its optical properties next to the graphite is very strong. And it's like this contrast between the matteness of the graphite and the the shine of gold is just absolutely like beautiful to me. It's like this mystical um, realm when you point light on it or you, when you dim the light, it reacts differently. So that kind of extra dimension to an art piece has become like a fixed element in all of my art pieces that's so nice to hear how you talk about it, it, it you know it proves that it's really your passion <laughs> it sounds so beautiful and um, in some of your posts you mentioned that your works are inspired by Chinese philosophy like Taoism yes. and um, when did you when did you discover this philosophy for yourself and what do you like the most in it yeah Taoism, how much time you got? <laughs> this is this is a big topic. We have all the time. <laughs> okay, so Tao Taoism Taoism has been a very profound part of my creative journey and my personal life. And I wish I can talk more about it to people because I, I just kind of communicate it through my work, but 
um, I feel like I articulate better through my art anyways. But Taoism, it's basically this uh, idea of building a very strong bond between you and your intuition. If I were to compare Taoism to like something or that, that going the path of nature and being in harmony with nature, it's, it's basically like if, if you want to go against the harmony of nature, it's like putting a block to block a stream of the river and when that if you do that you're you might end up with like a devastating flooding and if we want if i want to compare it to how the human being would react it's an anxiety stress it's it's basically you going against your own nature and your own heart and trying to fit in the mold of society and and the biggest part about taoism that interests me is and this is this this was the big turning point for me as a person and as an artist is that it tells you that your mind is not yours it's a social con socially construct organ it's you, we have this like build up of experiences and beliefs and knowledge from our parents and our grandparents it's not ours we don't even have we don't even have the choice to name ourselves so to actually transition from someone who's just, you know, existing to someone who's very in tune with their instincts, it's a bit of a challenge because you have to shed a lot of that um, preconceived notion of like, you have to do this, you have to be more logical, this doesn't make sense, you have to plan more and and you, you kind of have to like let go of all of these, uh, all of that and just surrender and give your heart full uh, authority over your mind. And uh, as a matter of fact, I found something really interesting and it's also in one of my art pieces that I never I haven't posted yet, but I'll, I'll send you a screenshot of it. Um, I actually featured a verse in the Quran that is in, like it's parallel to a Taoist thought and it talks about the function of the heart. And in the, it's in Surah Al-Hajj and it talks about how the like it's the heart, the treatment of the word heart is addressed as the think as the thing that reasons. It's the thing that does the thinking for you. So the fact that, you know, like God would use the heart and tell us you have to think with your heart. It's it, to me, that was like such a it was like a goosebumps moment. Like when me and my sister would talk about this, we, we get goosebumps because it's like, wow, like a lot of philosophies talk about this. And now looking back uh, now, you know, looking into our religion, there's there's a lot of parallels there. So it kind of strengthened that bond with Taoism even more. Sure. I think more you, you know, you try to learn different philosophies, more you understand uh, like many things that are even in, um, let's say, in, in, in religions, because it widens your horizon. And then, you know, you understand it from another corner, let's say. Exactly. And but it's so important for artists to to get in your flow uh, state. And I think that's great that you have this too. But I would like to know, is it a cliche or maybe you can change my mind that if I read the Bible, biographies of um, artistic, creative people, very often I see that they had a lot of emotional waves or even sometimes in their lives. And um, so I'm, I'm very curious why the artistic people, it seems that like often they need these emotions. Is it also your case or you find your uh, balance in harmony and calm? So, and do you think this is really the like generalization or it's something that is true? <laughs> I think it's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think um, I think art and my emotions are very interconnected. I do make art when I'm, you know, when I'm happy and when I'm sad and that reflects on the subject matter. But however, I I feel like um, when I'm going through something like an emotional or like so like a rough patch in life, I my there's like this influx of concepts. I think a lot like I start coming up with a lot more uh, art pieces. I spend a lot more time on my art. I'm way more productive. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, I guess we need some pain <laughs> to create. But yeah, and I've always I've always viewed art as my therapy. It was never it was never a hobby. It's never a hobby to me. It's it's a, it's therapeutic. It's like I'm just. Today, I'm going to try to feel better and, uh, you know, heal my energy through creation.
Yeah, to be honest, I think it, it's not only about artistic people. I mean, somehow it's a mystery of life that sometimes when we have pain, we do uh, get more productive. And um, so, you know, it's good to have a balance, but sure. it's uh, really interesting how it works. It pushes you, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and there is another, maybe cliche, maybe not, that uh, artistic people, uh, they do need solitude in order to create. They need, they're they very often introverted people, even though they give so much Absolutely. to the society. Yes. Yeah. Um, I seclusion is a huge part of finding inspiration, and it's a, it's a big part of the creative journey for me. To be alone, and it's not it's not like I am a loner or I just want to be alone and not surrounded by people. But I am definitely on the more introverted spectrum of society, and like when I'm I like to be around my family and friends once in a while. But when I I'm around people for too long. I have this this like urge to go back to the studio and I feel like I regain energy from creating art. It's not just from being alone because some people just want to be alone in their own zone. For me it's that space has to be accompanied with my art tools and like me actually working on something. And where do you get your inspiration? Oh, inspiration. Um I have an endless source of inspiration. I'm, I, I feel like I'm inspired all the time. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm, I'm always like high on nature of life. I've, I've, I can, I, I can find inspiration in like a passing cloud. <laughs> I can find inspiration in like a conversation I've had with someone, and and it like you know sparked an image. I, I find muses in people's faces. Some people like the way. God placed their birthmarks. Like one of my art pieces, I I, I asked one of my friends that to draw her because I was just fascinated by the placement of her birthmarks. I was like, I have to I have to have your <laughs> face in one of my pieces. So it's 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 endless. It's absolutely endless. Poetry, philosophy, um, patterns in nature. My like my dog's snout to me is a big source of inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> and what's about music, actually? And music. Is... So music. So if we're talking about flow state, music actually is a nice, uh, uh, like it's like my express highway to the flow state. I it definitely helps. Um, yeah, I absolutely love listening to music. Talking about your Palestinian roots, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you've never been to Palestine, is it right? No, I haven't. And it's been, you know what? I actually plan to go this year. I plan. Mm. Can you believe this? I actually there was a there's a group of Palestinians here, Palestinian Palestinian community of uh, youth, and they actually wanted to plan a big trip to Palestine, but Corona happened, and unfortunately that was postponed or you know until later yes. date. Uh, but I would absolutely love to. Yeah, I've never been, and I, you know, like it's it's a dream. When you're born a Palestinian refugee, it's uh it's just like this constant yearning for wanting to like see home they want to smell the, the air you just want to like experience the presence of this holy like country and and just see your country see your land what about you have you been Yes, I've been there two years, three years ago, and I totally understand what you mean because uh, I was born in Soviet Union and then in Russia, and it was an incredible feeling to be there. So I really wish you get there, of course, when the situation gets back to normal. And you know what really impresses me that, uh, like, you are um, uh, an example of this kind of person that never been to Palestine, but you have Palestinian roots. But if I see your works, um, uh, I mean, there you can see so much of it there, you know, and uh, it's incredible because you can see Palestinian touch in your works. And uh, also, I know that you do quite a lot for Palestine and society. So, I mean, when did you discover this um, cultural identity or this, uh, let's say, this connection to Palestine while being in another country? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So just like I said, being a born a Palestinian refugee, like I, you know, I was born in Kuwait and never stepped a foot in my country. And just I've always witnessed this struggle and this the resilience of Palestinians just from afar. And 
And I'm very aware of our case and of our of the passion behind it and how we need to kind of keep that alive to actually get somewhere um, with our with our with our cause. Uh, I feel like we all collectively Palestinians abroad feel this um, intrinsic responsibility to contribute to Palestine. No matter what we do, even if you're selling potatoes on the road, they have to be the best potatoes so that you're known as this guy who makes, the Palestinian guy who makes the best potatoes in the world. You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. We have everything we do. And I feel like being Palestinian has something to do with this drive. Um, everything we do, we want to pour our hearts into it. We don't, we, we don't sell or settle for local... Um, recognition we want to be globally known as the palestinian this who did this and who contributed to the world with this like if palestinians get into politics we get rashid atleb we get the el salvadorian president he's he's originally from palestine which is crazy yeah. so yeah i feel like it's just um it's it, and i feel like to keep it alive i i we all we're very palestinian in my household like um everything around me is palestinian we still speak the language we our food is very palestinian we we pro i probably overdosed on akawi cheese to be honest <laughs> what is your favorite palestinian dish by the way oh, favorite? <laughs> oh god well there's a few i love i like msakhan i really uh, like yes. msakhan but msakhan i would say msakhan is my top favorite yeah yeah what about you Well, I, I love Mlechie, I love, uh, is one of you know, Bamiya, like many things. But it's so funny because, uh, you know, during most of my interviews, everybody speaks about Maklube. Oh, really? <laughs> And I was like Maklube already thinking, okay. are you? <laughs> I like Maklube, but it's like, yeah, it's not as exciting to me as, as Msakhan. Msakhan is just another level. Too much flavor. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's great. And, um... I also know that you did have some, uh, you had some oh, pieces, some works that, uh, where you used the sand and stones from Palestine, I did. right? Yes, I, I, there were, these pieces were specifically made for the Museum of Palestinian People in Washington, D.C. And they were exhibited there like on the opening night. Um, and that was like one of my most exciting collections, to be honest. I briefly brought this idea up to a friend of mine. Her name is Amina. She's actually one of the co-founders of Pali Roots. Um, and I briefly ta told her, like, I'm thinking of, I would love to, like, have pieces of Palestine. I want to travel and get some sand from Palestine and, and incorporate it into my work, either varnish it or just use it as an element in my pieces. And then she so kindly sent me a pack, like, sent me some sand and actual pieces of bark from a tree called the Al-Baddawi tree. And it's one of the oldest olive, olive trees in Bethlehem in Palestine. Mm -hmm. So I I was obviously like thrilled and uh, I I included all these like the part the pieces of pieces of of Palestine are in all of all of the museum collection and it just brought this like it was crazy just like knowing that there's a piece of the land in the in the painting that talks that screams our right of return and talks about glorifies our cultures it just made them that much more special And um, I know that on your um, on your website uh, there is a special um, page where you can see um, about your charity. You can read about your charity programs, and you have a foundation. Uh, can you please tell a bit more about the programs that you have? Yes, I my biggest focus in 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 kind of giving back or wanting to do anything in terms of like a humanitarian initiative. My biggest focus is the children of Palestine because they're our future. And um, and there was this study done uh, that says 65% of the children, especially in Gaza, actually suffer from psychological distress and mental health issues. So that really made me like stop and think like, how can we, how can we, how can we change this? Is there any way we can do something about this? Even if it's, even if it's like, even if it's through art, is there a solution or is there a like a potential um 
thing that would kind of mend that situation for them. And I, I, I started thinking about art therapy and, um, and, and I started thinking of building a school and this, this system could be replicated in different parts of the world, but I really want to start it in Palestine. And the school would be run by teachers who, all, who are well-versed in art therapy. And essentially it would, this, the whole idea and the whole goal of this is to turn their trauma into art. So they, and it's kind of like this, just a, it's like a psychological switch for them. We went through something, we went through so much pain and suffering, but now that it's on a piece of paper and now that it's like this, this visual, um, this is, this is just going to remind us of our, you know, like the fact that we, we had the courage to survive that time period of our life. So it's turn and turning and basically, and it's also a piece of art. So yeah, turning pain into art is the whole idea of this uh, initiative, and um, hopefully they can also. In, part of part of the idea is just to have them sell their art through an online store, and and create jobs for teachers who are who would be interested in this cause. Yeah, it's actually been a passion of mine for a very long time now, and I'm just in the process of gathering resources and wanting to really implement this and I feel like I may need to go down there to actually like scout for teachers or just to get get an idea of how real real estate operates down sure. there and and yeah how to the next steps for this that's a great initiative and uh, like if someone wants to participate in it they can see all the information on your website right yes, of course I actually have a dedicated page on my site under charity where all the proceeds from the prints that you that are listed there or the products go to the initiative. We will leave the link <laughs> to your website. Thank you. Thank you. So, and I have now some short, uh, short questions um, to get to know even more about your personality. Um, um, are there some books that have left influence in your life that you would like maybe to read or you could recommend? Yes, there are a few. So uh, one that I, there are a few, I'm going to try to remember the ones that I've recently read and they left an impact on me. Uh, one is Daring Greatly by Brene Brown and uh, one, another one would be the book on the Quran by an author. He's a linguistic professor. His name is Mahmoud Shahroor and uh, sorry, Mohammed Shahroor. Well, I don't know why I said Mohammed Shahroor, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm currently reading and really enjoying a book by Vishen uh, Lakiani, and it's called The Code of the Extraordinary Mind. Um, and a book that I would that I read and I would continue on reading is uh, The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, which, which I find very inspiring. I feel like every time I reread a passage in it, I get another gem to like create art through like it's, it's 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 crazy the amount of inspiration i find in that book and one more i have to mention is digital minimalism this is a an incredible book incredible book about optimizing your exposure like your social media exposure and uh, not let it get in the way of your potential i i guess by mm -hmm. cal newport yeah thank you for for sharing that Thanks. and um what is for your happiness um okay that's also another heavy <laughs> question happiness um happiness for me is the ability to express and it took me a while to come up to to reach this conclusion but this for me it's your ability to express yourself authentically once you reach that you are happy you will that that is ultimate happiness for me and what i mean by that is that to not suppress your emotions because suppression is suppression of emotion is basically a dark road to illness and in return in turn it's that's misery and um and yeah i feel like to find you need to find your language so that you can communicate your emotions and your thoughts and it could be music, it could be through music, it could be through poetry, through art. And it's a shame that, um, and it's unfortunate that our school systems don't really nurture creativity as much as they should be. We need to definitely do better in that, reg in that regard. Um, we need to put more emphasis on different outlets of expression, not just academic and, um, you know, math and physics. <laughs> yeah, there are people who are just absolutely brilliant, like prodigies, but they're just not like, you know, like, 
the academic uh the like the subjects that are being studied in school are not their focus that's not their mean of expression and they just can't communicate their intellect through them as much so yeah those would be uh that would be my my uh, happiness <laughs> My definition. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> And um, do you have a favorite, favorite quote or what is your life motto? You can choose this or that or both. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a few actually, but the one that I like always, always sticks with me and speaks to me is do it with passion or not at all. So people, you can be gifted, you can be talented, people will recognize the talent, they'll applaud you for it, but being passionate is a little different, and I feel like passion is what resonates with people. That's what, like, that's what can sell an actual project, uh, that's what can change your idea from an idea to something revolutionary, because people can feel and sense the passion, even if you're in so like even if you're at the end of the world people will still like it will resonate so yeah do right. everything you do do it with passion or don't even bother right i think when you do it with passion you are like a diamond you know everybody can see you shining and uh, this shining through your works and my last question to you if you had chance to um to look back what would you wish to your 10 years old self oh, okay that's <laughs> interesting hmm um one would be i would i would tell i would tell her to keep drawing uh because and don't feel too don't feel bad about spending so much time on art because one day people will will appreciate it and it will pay off and um another thing is i would i would tell her that throughout life you're gonna lose a lot of people along the way, a lot of friends and just people that you thought had a big part of your life, but that's because you change and you evolve and it's okay. Um, and what else? Yeah, I feel like, and don't get attached to anything because attachment is the root of all suffering. Thank you so much. It was really, really interesting talking to thank you, you and I wish you a lot you. of luck with all your projects, uh, you so with much. your artworks and with your charity programs, of course. Thank you. And um, yes, an your, your story pleasure. and your works are very inspiring. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Diana.